The more I use this machine, the more of its shortcomings I notice. And the more time I spend fixing them, the more I use the machine. Is that a vicious cycle or a virtuous one? Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. In my last video, I made an adapter to install a Hardinch D13 speed call it chuck on my lathe. And if you saw that video, you know that the run out of the final setup did not make me happy. I need to spend some time getting to the bottom of that, but before I do, there's another glaring weakness of the lathe that needs to be addressed. In a previous video, I made an adapter to put this Hardinch speed call it chuck on my Grizzly Geo602 lathe. What I forgot though is that I have no spindle break, so getting this thing tightened and loosened is really a challenge. Now I did discover that I can use the inertia to unlock it with a little quick flick of the wrist, but unfortunately locking it is much harder. I've not been successful doing this. You have to immobilize the spindle and lock it, and even then I'm not sure I'm getting it tight enough. So I did some research to see if anybody else had made a spindle break for this lathe, and I came across this video from Bison Workshop. And he actually had a really simple idea that I just completely had not even thought about. He just put a block on the headstock of the lathe and put a pin through it to engage the spanner holes that are already in the spindle nose. So you just put the pin in and you can spin the chucks on and off and it immobilizes the spindle. I was thinking of doing something much more complicated like with a hydraulic bicycle brake on the pulley end, but the pin in the hole is a very simple idea and it's easy to execute. I've seen this done on the Grizzly Geo 704 mil for locking the spindle for tightening the drawbar, and it will work just as well here. By the way, I'll put a link to that Bison Workshop video down in the video description, so check that out if you're interested. Of course, there's no good way to hang on to this thing to unscrew it, so I've been playing around with a strap wrench. Jury's still out on how well that works. But if I'm going to make a pin break, I need some precise measurements. I've got a 312 thou pin and it just exactly fits in these holes. So they're 5 sixteenths or 8 millimeter probably. The critical dimension though is how far that hole is from the surface of the headstock. And I can measure that with gauge blocks, or rather a gauge block. The only one I can get in there is a 50 thou and then I can use feeler gauges from there to figure out what the space is between the pin and the headstock. The other critical dimension here is how thick I can make the block before it runs into something. This groove in the spindle nose is where the clamps fit. These clamps hold the chucks on and keep them from unscrewing if you run them in reverse or decelerate suddenly. So I need to know the thickness of that part of the spindle nose and I can measure that also with gauge blocks. Just stack them up, put a spacer or a wear block on the top and feel my way to an accurate dimension. With accurate dimensions for the spindle nose, the first thing I did was come into Fusion 360 and update my CAD model for the spindle nose. I'm treating this back surface as though it's coplanar with the surface of the headstock and I've accurately located the hole based on that and I've also located this first step register on the spindle nose to make sure that those dimensions reflect reality. So then I can just bring this in and use it to define all of the other features for the spindle lock. Now I went ahead and put the clamps in here in the position where I think they're gonna be, but worst case scenario, they can come back and touch the surface on the spindle nose. So if I look at the difference between that surface and the face of the block, I've still got about 0.4 millimeters. It's not a lot of clearance, but clearance is clearance, as they say. So I've got a pin through the hole in the block that can just slide in and out to engage the spindle nose, and I went ahead and designed what will be a 3D printed plastic handle for it. Now inside the block here, I have more than a simple hole. I could have just you know, made a simple pin, but I wanted something a little better, so I designed a spring detent mechanism. So I've got a four millimeter ball bearing in here. I've got grooves in the pin, and I've got a spring that presses that ball bearing up into the grooves. The grooves are square on one side and ramped on the other, the idea being that the ball will get trapped so the pin can move back and forth between these two positions. The square edge should not push the ball down while the ramped edge will, so it should be able to move in one direction but not the other. Now if I wanted to make this really secure, I would make the ball seat deeper into the groove, but I don't want to get it over center and jam, so 
I'll start conservative and I can always make the grooves deeper later if I need to. To retain the spring, I've got a plastic cap here that I'll just 3D print and it's designed with a little pocket to hold the end of the spring. If I need less spring compression, I can make this cap taller with a deeper hole. If I need more, I can actually put a little pin on it that extends into the hole. It gives me the ability to adjust that later as well. As long as I'm in CAD and I have a 3D printer, I might as well design a drill jig. This is just a part that fits tightly up against the spindle nose. Get it in position, clamp it in place on the lathe, and it'll give me a guide for drilling the holes in the headstock. With that done, I drug the model into the drawing space and created a set of mechanical drawings so that I can make the parts I need out of steel out in the shop. But there's gonna be a lot of work here and before I jump right into that, I wanna go ahead and 3D print prototypes first and test the fit. I'm printing these on the Bamboo Lab P1S and I went ahead and just stacked everything up. Now I do have a version of the handle laying flat on the bed that I can actually put on the steel pin but I went ahead and printed another version of it standing up with the pin attached, just so that I have a prototype that I can use for fitment. I've got the parts off the printer and they all look great with a couple of exceptions. Now this pin was printed vertically and there is a 90 degree overhang here. And I knew that that was not going to print properly, but I didn't bother with support material because I didn't want to mess around with removing it. I figured it would be goobered up a little bit, and it is, but I'll just remove the ridge with sandpaper. So in the outboard position, it's not going to lock as securely, but it'll be fine. I'm just trying to figure out if everything fits and if the dimensions are right. The block looks good, but with these small holes, the dimensions really matter. So I'll go ahead and drill it out with the correct size drill. It didn't really remove much. It mostly just cleaned it up so it was nice and smooth and cylindrical. And then I'll run an M3 tap through the threaded holes here. The printer is, I mean, it's just pure fantasy if you think it's going to print M3 threads. Now the bore on this pin is also very, very close. It will go in there, but you'll never get it out without breaking it. So I'm going to go ahead and run a reamer through that as well. This is a 5 16 inch reamer. 8 millimeter would work just as well. And I'll just run this through slowly, trying not to run it too fast so it doesn't melt the plastic, but that's always a risk in 3D printed parts. Now with that reamed out, the fit's beautiful. Now the real reason I wanted a prototype though was to test the ball detent mechanism. So let's go ahead and assemble that and put the pin in first. And I have a four millimeter ball bearing here. I got this by disassembling a normal 608 size skate bearing. Turns out the balls in those are four millimeters. At least the one I took apart had four millimeter balls in it. And I took apart a whole bunch of pins trying to find the spring I wanted. And all of the pins except for one had springs that were too large. And the one exception is this pen that I got from Automation Direct. It's, you know, just swag that they put in a package they shipped to me, and the spring in that is perfect. Fits nice and neat in the hole. And then I'll just go ahead and put the cap on with two M3 button head screws. And with that on and tightened down, we should be able to test the spring detent mechanism. And that works pretty well. Now I think the steel version of this is gonna be smoother, but I'm pretty happy with that and the dimensions look right to me. So I think that is gonna work. I've got the drill guide here and you can see the drill guide extends just a little bit further than the block, just like it does in the CAD model. But you can also see that the holes don't line up. So that's a good thing to discover now before I go and drill holes in the lathe. And that's one of the reasons why I do 3D printed prototypes is I discover obvious problems like that. Of course, I don't want to actually ruin my nice automation direct pen. So I'll take this other spring that came out of a pen that I had to break to open. Put that back together, and it's good as new. Back over at the lathe, the critical dimension is the location of the pin relative to the face of the headstock. And that seems just about perfect. It goes in nice and easy and smooth. It's centered in the hole. It seems just about right to me. 
Now, what about the fit of the rest of the mechanism and the space that we have available? That looks pretty good to me. Of course, I'll have to take that sticker off, but uh, if I set this parallel to the top edge of the lathe, it is out of the way where I'm not gonna bump it. If I pull the handle out, it's just flush with the front of the lathe. I think the dimensions on this are just about perfect. Of course, that's why I measured in the first place, but it's always nice to see when it turns out to fit in the end. Got the drilling guide here, and that fits very securely against the spindle nose. I wasn't really sure how that was gonna fit, but I should be able to easily line that up parallel to the top of the lathe, put a clamp on it, and use that as a guide to drill the holes. And looking at the length here, I do think that's gonna hold back the block so that it doesn't run into the little flange that's covering the bearings. Yeah, I think this is gonna work. I think it's time to go over to the mill and start making parts. We've got to remember to move those holes though and reprint the drilling guide or we will have a bad day. I've got a chunk of hot rolled steel here that I sawed out of a larger piece and the first task is gonna to be to square it up like with most projects. I'm using a three quarter inch inserted end mill. I know in the last project when I used this steel, I used a fly cutter and it made such a mess. I decided to try something different that won't throw the chips quite as far. Now I've got quite a bit of material to take off here, so I'm going to do this in multiple passes. I was getting some vibration in the shield over my quill DRO scale, so I slowed it down a little bit just to get it out of the resonant range. And I just went back and forth, taking multiple passes, you know, a couple millimeters at a time to get it down to the dimension that I need. And I'll take the burrs off with the NSK pencil grinder. And now that I've got one side flat, I'll tip it up with that flat side against the fixed jaw of the vise and clean up one edge. With that cleaned up edge deburred, now I'll flip it over so I've got the flat side against the fixed jaw, the one milled side down on the parallel, and I hung it out the end of the vise so that I could get a micrometer on it to measure it, but as you can see, as I milled across, it started lifting. And the reason is because I don't have any packing in the vise. All the clamping is on one side. The vise jaw is cocking at an angle and only holding on one edge. And the tool pressure from this insert end mill just pushed it up. So fortunately, I didn't get all the way down past my final dimension. So I'll go ahead and just put this in the center and we'll go back, clean that up and then bring it down to the final dimension. If I had gone any further at all and gone any deeper, I would have had to start all over, but I ended up just by a few hundredths of a millimeter being able to save this part. And it turned out I could get the micrometer in there anyway. Okay, with two edges parallel, I can clamp those in the vise and do the remaining flat side and just bring that down to my desired thickness. And then we're ready to do the ends. Now, because I'm gonna stand this up to do the ends, I'm gonna switch to a carbide roughing end mill just to reduce the tool pressure. This is narrower, it's only a half inch end mill, so this would have been slower for the larger sides, but it'll be just fine for the end. And because there's less tool pressure, it'll be less likely to push it out of vertical. I'm just going to set this up with a square. I'm not going to bother trying to indicate it. It just doesn't have to be that precise. And it turns out you can get pretty close with a square anyway. Clean up one end, pull it out, deburr it, flip it over, and then bring the other end down to length. And I had several millimeters of excess length here, so I did this in several passes. And I couldn't really get the micrometer that I needed in here, so I'm just using the tail rod in a set of calipers to measure my length. Put that into the DRO, and then take my final pass. Deburr that, and we've got the blank squared and sized. Putting the lengthwise hole through this block is probably the point at which I'm most likely to screw this up. 
Drills tend to wander, and if this wanders much at all, it's going to scrap the part. I'm setting it up just using the square again, and then I will find the location of the hole using an edge finder. It's not centered, so I'm going to get a zero on the back of the part. That's a half inch edge finder, so I'll just enter plus 0.25 for Y in the DRO, and then I will use the half function on the right and left to find the center line. Then I'll just move the mill to the correct location with the DRO. Now I'm going to start by spotting with 120 degree spotting drill, and I'm using just the lightest pressure that I can to establish this location. I've got the lock on the quill partially locked just to try to avoid any deflection. I want this to go in as straight as I possibly can. So I'll get a nice healthy spot and then I will switch to the drill. This is a pre-ream drill, so this is a 64th of an inch less than the 5 16th target diameter. Now I'll just start in the spot and just start working this down slowly and carefully. Again, I don't want to put too much pressure on it. I need enough pressure for it to cut, but I don't want to put enough pressure on it to flex anything or push the spindle off center at all. So we get the hole started and then start applying a little bit more pressure and working our way down. And I'm using a screw machine length drill or a short drill here first, and I will drill this down as far as I can. Didn't want to start right away with a jobber drill because longer drill is more flexible give this hole the best chance of getting started straight that we possibly can. And then once I've exhausted the flute length on that, we'll switch to the jobber drill to finish this out. Now I set up the block on a parallel when I put it in here, got it clamped nice and tight, and then I took the parallel out so we can drill through the bottom. And then I'll just work my way down with the jobber drill, trusting the hole that I've already established to guide it, and hopefully it'll go straight and come out the bottom and not out the side. Now I'm pecking, I'm using lots of lubricant, I'm clearing the chips just to make sure that we don't end up with some kind of a chip welding problem or get this thing jammed and break off a drill in the hole. I definitely don't want to start all over at this point. And that's the hole through. Now that is 1 64th of an inch undersize. So we'll bring in the 5 16 inch reamer and run that through. Now I am using cutting oil on this, so that will cause the reamer to cut at or slightly oversize, where if you use something like a water soluble oil coolant, uh, it'll tend to cut a little bit smaller. So this should give us a clearance hole for a 5 16 pin or a very, very close fit for a 5 16 pin. I'm definitely gonna turn the pin undersize anyway, but We'll run this through and get the straightest, cleanest hole that we can. I'm running this relatively slow and I'm advancing slowly and I'm just going to push it all the way through in one smooth motion. I'm not going to pull it back out. I'm not going to give it a chance to get misaligned or overcut the top of the hole. We'll run it all the way through the bottom and then pull it back out slowly all in one pass. So we should get a clean cylindrical hole. Now, if the drill wandered at all, then the error will be at the bottom of the hole. The, the location of the top of the hole will be pretty close to where it's supposed to be. So I will mark the top of the part with a center punch just so I can keep track of it. This is the side that I want towards the spindle nose to make sure that the alignment is as good as we can get it. Now, if you're a patron, then you might have seen this behind the scenes video that I posted actually measuring the location of the hole. The web on the thin side on one end is 1.58 millimeters, and when I measure on the other end, 1.58 millimeters. So all that work to try to make the hole go straight paid off. In the side of the block, we need a through hole for the spring and two M3 threaded holes to screw on the cap. And this is just the same drill that you've seen time and time again, pun intended. I'll go ahead and spot all three holes and then we'll come back and drill them. Starting with the tap drill for M3 and I just put a little sharpie mark on the drill so I can see how far I need to go. I don't want to break through into the bore. 
We'll just use plenty of oil, take this nice and easy. You could probably run this quite a lot faster, but I was tired of cranking, and uh, so this is the speed we're going to run. Get both of those holes to depth, not breaking through into the bore. And then I'll put in the number 18 drill to make the clearance hole for the spring. Now this one does need to go through. But I'd like to not go too far through and raise a big burr or mangle up the hole. So we'll just go till we break into the bore. And there we are. Now you have seen me power tap M3 holes, but I am not going to do that today. Because these are blind holes and they're only about 10 millimeters deep, I just took the mill out of gear and I'll just turn the check by hand and run these in. Could have gone and grabbed a tap wrench, but this is just as easy. And the tap wrench is like three steps away off to my right and I don't want to have to walk that far. Run those down till I can feel them bottom and then just spin it back out. Now it would be very tempting to just put the mill in reverse and run it back out under power, but the mill turns both ways. And I know myself well enough to know that if I try that, there's a pretty good chance I'm gonna run it the wrong way and snap off the tap. Put some chamfers on those top edges. And now the question is, did we raise a burr between the spring hole and the bore since they are in communication? So I've got a pin that fits the bore and that goes right past the spring hole without any issue. If I pull that back, the pin that fits the spring hole will go into the bore. So yeah, I don't think we have any appreciable burr in there. I don't think we need to do anything. I have the mounting holes dimensioned off of the left hand end. So we'll just touch off with a half inch edge finder at our minus 0.25 inches into the DRO and then use the vice jaws to find the center line between the front and back. Now these holes probably don't need to be spotted, but the drill's right here. So I'll go ahead and spot those locations and then switch to a through hole for M5. Uh, these are going to be M5 screws that hold this to the headstock. So this is what about a five and a half millimeter drill and I will just push that all the way through in all three locations. And I'll switch over to an M5 piloted counter bore. Bring that down, touch it off, lock the quill, and then lower the knee a couple of thousandths before I spin this up just so that it doesn't grab. Get lots of lubricant on there and then I will just raise the knee to cut the counter bore. I've got the dimension on the drawing, so I'm just watching the DRO and raising the knee until we get to the right depth. And just repeat that for the other two holes. I'll deburr those with a Noga rotary countersink and we should be just about done with this part. The last feature on this block is the concave end and to cut that I need to hang it out the end of the vise. And we saw what happened last time so I've got an adjustable parallel in the other end of the vise to keep the jaw straight, keep the part from lifting. So we'll clamp that in and that should be nice and secure. Use the edge finder just like before to locate the center line and the left hand end that everything is dimensioned off of and then we'll set the DRO to incremental mode and find the right hand end. And the reason I'm doing that is so that I can set the diameter on the boring head. So I have my incremental DRO zero set on the end of the part and I know the radius I want so I will just move the mill spindle that distance away from the part. And then I can just lower the tool down and I can adjust the boring head until the tip of the tool just barely touches the part. Now it turned out this boring head is just barely big enough for this. I didn't know that when I was drawing it. 
but it just barely reaches. So I can feel it touching. I can just barely see it scratching. And you can hear it. Okay, so now we're set to the right radius. And I also know the center point of the arc that I want to cut. So I'll just lube this up and I'll start taking passes and start moving the mill in towards that known center point that I took off of the drawings. And when we reach that center point, the arc should be the dimension shown in the CAD model. I'm using the power down feed on the mill head just to make sure I get a nice consistent cut and I don't do something stupid and jam the quill into the part and break something. And this is going nice and easy. Now, it is an interrupted cut and doubly so when it goes into the hole, so I'm not in a hurry. I'm not taking deep cuts. I'm just letting it cut nice and easy. And then on the last pass, I flipped it around and ran it up, just taking a spring pass to clean up the surface finish. And it left a very nice surface finish indeed. It also left a really wicked burr on the bottom side. So I'll take that over and use the pencil grinder to take that off as well. And with that done, all the milling on this part is complete. And we could use this exactly as it is. Eh, I have a surface grinder. I'll probably at some point run this through it before it goes on the mill, but this part is perfectly usable exactly as is. Now we just need to make the pin. I really wanted to finish this project today, but I am unfortunately out of time. Next week, we will turn the locking pin along with all the features to make the ball detent work. We'll get it installed on the lathe and we'll see how it works. I think it's going to work. If you're enjoying this project, give the video a thumbs up, subscribe, and Maybe consider supporting the channel over on Patreon. Patrons can download the CAD model, the drawings, and the 3D printable files for this and all of my other projects. And if you're already a patron, thank you. You help make all of this possible. Thank you for watching.